<laughs> Hello, everybody. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you're joining us. Uh, I am Ipek Tunja, um, a member of the TCIAC Silicon Valley Network, and I'm excited to be hosting today's webinar. Um, we're going to go ahead and jump into the conversation uh, very shortly, but before we do that, I wanted to just um, provide a quick overview of the Silicon Valley Network for TCIAC. Uh, we're really a group of um, professionals, entrepreneurs, researchers who are in the San Francisco Bay Area, um, who network, connect with each other, learn from one another, um, as well as make connections and work with TUSIAT members in Istanbul. Um, and of course, TUSIAT is the um, primary business network in Turkey. Uh, we've been around since 2017 at the helm of our peerless leader, Ayşegül Ildeniz. And we do multiple activities um, throughout the year. Um, most of them have been obviously online recently um, due to the pandemic, but we're hoping to get back to in-person activities real soon. We're hoping that you will all join the network, join our activities, and also um, help volunteer to put some of these amazing um, activations together. I'm very excited to be hosting um, today's conversation about the creator economy and social media marketing. Um, our guest is um, Brooke Ozaydenne. And um, let me tell you a little bit about Brooke and we'll jump right into the conversation. Um, she's a creator marketing manager at Instagram. And she's also the creator and the host of the Naked Beauty podcast. Prior to Instagram, um, Brooke worked at Viacom overseeing digital marketing and content strategy. And before that, she was at Ralph Lauren as a social media manager, overseeing the social strategy for their luxury brands. Uh, Brooke started her career in London as a product marketing manager for Nokia's entertainment team after graduating from Stanford University. Brooke, thank you so much for joining us. Welcome. Thank you, Ipek. I'm very happy to be here. And this is like the first panel I've done in a long time where I didn't have to tell someone how to pronounce my last name. And so that was very <laughs> exciting for me. Um, I'm very excited to be here. Excellent. Well, we're very excited to have you. Our topic today is obviously, you know, the creator economy. So why don't we just start out with the basics? Let's talk about, you know, what is a creator? And is that the same thing as an influencer or not, et cetera? So let's just dive right there. Yeah, so it's a really interesting question. I've been at Instagram for four years, and I think when I first joined in 2018, that term influencer was much more prevalent, and now we're seeing the industry kind of move to the term influencer. And of course, creators have influence, right? But I think influencer sometimes makes it seem as if you are always selling a product and that's the way that you monetize. Whereas there are people that are creators and they are monetizing simply off of their content, like simply off of like subscriptions or people buying, you know, badges from them in live. And I do think content creator, like the term creator, feels a little bit more true to what these people are doing than influencer, right? So you can still have influence, but I think the term creator is more representative of what's being done because you are a content creator. Okay, excellent. Um, so that dives right into, so what do we mean when we say the creator economy? Yeah, so the, the creator economy is, well, one, it's growing more and more every month, every year, but the creator economy really just means people that have been able to take their passion and turn it into a sustainable business. They're able to build a brand and a community and find opportunities to monetize around their passion, whether that's cooking or video games. In my case, it's been beauty and skincare. Um, but it's that ability to build a business around what you're passionate about. Yeah, and it's very much about the empowerment of the individual, right, as a creator. Yes, it's super empowering because if you think about the way it used to be, you had all of these gatekeepers. You needed, you know, if you wanted to have a TV show, you had to go to MTV and say, okay, I have this idea. I want to make a show. Or if you had a product, you'd have to find, you know, investors to believe in what you're doing. Now it's so much more democratic. All of those barriers are removed. You can take that idea, use our platforms and build a business around it. Excellent. So um, I, I guess, you know, in terms of like why it matters so much to so many people, that's where that whole magic lies, right? 
Yes. I mean, I think the magic is when you are really passionate about something and you can cultivate a community of people that are also passionate about the same thing, then it becomes something that's really enriching. It's very authentic to you. Of course, brands love it because they know, okay, for, I'll use myself as an example. Okay. You've, you've cultivated a whole community of people that are interested in makeup and skincare and hair care, and they trust you. So this is really an exciting way for, for us to work with you versus, you know, traditional advertising, you'd hire an actor, you'd shoot a commercial, people know it's an ad it doesn't feel as authentic I think there's so much power in working with creators to get your brand messages out there because they are tapping into an audience that knows them and trusts them and it just I, I think that brands will only continue to work with creators for advertising yeah that's amazing um we'll talk a little bit about like what it means for corporations and brands also and dive a little bit deeper but let's kind of maybe stay on the creator side for a minute, which is and the question that I wanted to really ask from you, for you both as a creator yourself, as well as somebody who works with creators, like what does it take to become a successful creator? There is no such thing as overnight success when it comes to being a successful creator. All of the creators that have really found success have been at it for a number of years. So I think one of the things that it takes to be a successful creator is consistency. You have to show up for your audience time and time again. You can't, you know, share something once a week and think that that's going to be enough. You have to have really kind of sustained always on messaging and content that your audience is seeing so that you can kind of develop that relationship over time. I think the other thing is, you know, social media is social. So you have to talk back to your audience. You have to respond to your DMs. You have to respond to the comments. You have to really cultivate a community. And that's a two-way street. It's not just you talking at your audience, but talking with your audience. So I think what some of the best creators do is they ask their audience regularly, what do you want to see from me? What do you want more of? Um, I'm going to make some reels this weekend. What are some topics that you think um, I should cover? So I think it's really about showing up, being consistent, having these kind of like two-way conversations. And also I think thinking about it as a business, if this is your full-time job being a creator, thinking about how can you make this a sustainable business and how, do you, how are you proactive about finding those revenue opportunities? Yeah. Um... Okay, so uh, you mentioned like the two-way conversation and also being authentic. How do you think, I mean, you can answer it from your personal perspective or from the best practices that you've seen. How do you think about like balancing the two? Like you want to be authentic to yourself and the content that you're creating. You also want to be able to address what that two-way dialogue might be bringing as an option for you to create. What, what about, and how do you think about balancing the two? Sure. Yeah. So I think, you know, as we say at Meta, like all feedback is a gift. Um, so you may not necessarily agree with the feedback and it may not feel authentic to you. Someone may say, oh, I want to see X, Y, and Z from you. And that may not um, resonate with what you personally want to share, but you can just kind of like take it as a data point, right? Like I think all feedback, whether you action on it or not, is helpful for you as a data point to think more about your content strategy. I don't think you have to do everything that your audience wants you to do, but I do think it is helpful to take in that feedback as just kind of like more analytical information about your content strategy. Yeah. Um... So um, you shared some advice in terms of like what it takes to be a successful creator, but I also um, see sometimes some rules of thumb in terms of like, you need to post at least this many times, uh, you need to do at least X, Y, Z. I don't know how you feel about those, whether yes. you think they exist, should exist or not, or, yeah. um, and if they do, do you have any practical, more kind of, I guess, um, specific tips to share? Sure. So, you know, nothing is going to work for everyone, right? So what, what, if, if, if you're doing something and you find success, it may not work for me. But I think when we think about, and I'll speak specifically about Instagram, we have all of these different, we call them surfaces. So we have Instagram live, we have stories, we have reels, we have feed, and the most successful creators use all of those surfaces to reach their audience. It's kind of like using, using every tool in the toolbox. So I think to be a successful creator, you do need to think about, okay, what is my real strategy? What is my story strategy? Maybe you don't go live every week, but maybe you think once a month, I'm going to go live and, and do Q&A. So I think it's about 
using all of the tools, definitely. I think that's very important. And even when you go to someone's profile, you want to see those highlights. Like you want to see that they are using the full suite of tools available to them. Now, in terms of how many posts should you do every week, I think that really varies. But as I mentioned before, you do want to have a consistent presence. So if you're only doing like one reel a month, for example, it's going to be hard to reach people um, because it's not that often. So I think for me personally, I try to do at least one to two reels a week. And I have found that that's helped me because reels is the most discoverable type of media on our platform right now. So if you think about reaching people that are not yet following you, Reels is the best way to do that. If I post you know, a nice picture on my feed, that's great, but that's only going to go to my existing followers. Reels is really exciting because it unlocks discovery. It means that anyone who's on the Reels tab could discover you and say, oh, this person looks really interesting. Let me go and see their other reels and then maybe let me go and follow them. So I do think if you're if you're focused on growth right now, I think reels is the absolute best place to get discovered. And if you have the stamina to do multiple reels a week, then that's great. A lot of people feel that that's a lot and, I, and I'm totally empathetic to that. But I do think that reels is going to give you like the most return on your investment to put it into business terms. Yeah. Uh, what would your advice be to somebody who is trying to get into reels and like the whole concept of video? Because it's very different than static image, right? And everyone's comfort level seems to vary. Um, yes. But it's also a reality that it is a form that um, creators are encouraged to embrace. <laughs> yes. So how does one get into it? Yeah, and I think, you know, and just to address that, I think, there's always going to be a place for photos on Instagram, right? We all love looking at photos, but what makes me very excited about video and what I think from like a creator marketing perspective, we're really excited about for video is video is a chance to tell your story and show your personality in a way that you just simply Mm -hmm. can't with a photograph. Um, I think that that storytelling aspect, that opportunity to share your unique point of view, that opportunity to share kind of what you're about in a more narrative format is just so much more kind of alive. And it's also a lot more entertaining, right? Like pictures can only be so entertaining. Like going to a museum is nice, but like watching Netflix may be like a little bit more entertaining. So um, unlocking video as a way to entertain people and tell your story is really powerful. Now, to your point about how comfortable people are, one of the campaigns that we have at right now is there's no right way to create reels. And I think that's really important. I think a lot of people feel a lot of pressure when it comes to video, like they want it to be perfect. But what we're seeing is that people actually like relatable content. You don't have to have a fancy camera and lighting. You can shoot everything on your phone. It's also okay if there's like a blooper or like one word gets messed up. Like you, it's, it doesn't have to be this perfectly polished piece of content. People love authenticity. They love real moments. And that's what makes a real kind of feel alive. It doesn't have to be this like perfect cinematic masterpiece. It can be casual. It can be simple. Awesome. Um, By the way, I forgot to mention that um, we're hoping that the audience will ask us questions on the Q&A panel as well, and I'm monitoring it, and I'll be happy to relay them, and we'll kind of get going and keep it interactive as much as possible. Um, All right, so obviously, I mentioned that you are a creator yourself. You um, created and are hosting regularly the Naked uh, Beauty Planet, Naked Beauty um, podcast, which you do on a weekly basis, which is a big feat in and of itself. Where do you find your inspiration? How do you create your own content? Yes. So one of the things that I do is I'm always testing and trying new uh, skincare products. And I think about what is my audience going to be interested in? So right now I'm like all about sunscreen, right? It's summertime and it's really hard to find a good sunscreen. So one of the things that I'm doing now is doing kind of like really honest sunscreen reviews, sharing the pros and cons. But what I'm constantly doing is thinking about who I'm speaking to and what's top of mind for them. 
And I think that's applicable for any industry, any community. It's like, you have to be really clear about who you're talking to and what's important to them right now. And how can you serve them in this exact moment with content that's related to what's top of mind for them? I think the other way that I get inspiration is just from everyday life. I think I, um, you know, things that I find myself really excited about, things that I want to communicate with my audience. I, I take time to actively put that into my content strategy. One of the things that we say is if you're excited about something, your audience will also be excited about it. You can tell when someone's really passionate about something and that translates through the video that they're doing. So if it's, if it's something you love, your audience will probably love it too. Awesome. Um, and I will just make a quick note for the audience that, um, I listened to multiple episodes of uh, Brooke's podcast. It is indeed amazing. Uh, there is one specifically about the Turkish beauty ritual rituals too, right? Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. So, you know, I, I go to Turkey every summer, um, maybe for the past six years now, and I love Turkey. And, um, you know, Turkey has such a unique and rich beauty culture. You know, there's like, going way back, there's like hammam as a beauty ritual. But then even today, if you think about like rose water and just the way that ingredients are looked at in, in Turkish beauty culture, it's really interesting. And so I wanted to do an episode speaking to women that I met in Turkey about what it's like to um, like live there full time and, and what, how beauty culture is different in Turkey versus in the US. One of the fun insights that I got was that um, a lot of women in Turkey, I think in Istanbul, like get their hair done at the hairdresser. It's like a blowout, like just every morning before work. And it's very affordable and it's very easy to do. And here in the US, that's like more of like a special occasion. Like, oh, you have a wedding, you get your hair done. But there it's kind of just like an everyday type of thing. I also spoke to a um, Black American woman who lived in Istanbul full time and her husband is Turkish. And just what, what is it like to be a Black American living in Turkey? And what's that experience like? So these are the kinds of stories that I love to tell. And then I think about using social media to amplify them. So how do I take clips from that podcast and make them shareable online so that people are enticed to listen to them? Thank you for sharing um, those insights. And yeah, it is an, it's a really, for me, very relatable and um, also, I'm sure, enlightening episode. Um, so we do have a few questions from the audience. Um, let me share the very first one. What are um, two to three big challenges of the creator economy today? So I think, well, I guess I would love to know if they mean from the creator perspective or from the brand perspective. I think one of the challenges from the, um, like from an overall perspective, I think we have to really think about how do we make content creation a sustainable lifestyle? So you've got like the superstar uh -huh. creators that have like millions of followers it's clear that they're going to be okay. But what about the long tail of creators, the kind of smaller and more emerging creators? How do we help make it sustainable for them to make a living from their passion? How do platforms think about um, rewarding creators for creating content on their app and paying them directly from the app? Um, I think that's going to be a really big challenge. We don't want to live in a world where creators need to rely on brand deals alone to make an income. They should be able to, um, you know, monetize just from their audience and just from the, the kind of content that they love to make. So I think that's going to be one of the challenges. I think there's also um, a bigger challenge also about because there are so many platforms and there's so much competition for um, creators time, how do we help creators of Avoid burnout. That's something that we hear about time and time again. A lot of creators just feel simply exhausted. They feel like they have to do so many things across so many platforms. So how do we help them really think about this is going to be the best um, value for your time? Uh, you don't have to do everything, but what you choose to do choose to do the things that are really going to pay off in terms of growth. So I think that's going to be really, really important, helping creators avoid burnout so that they still feel motivated to show up and continue to make content. Okay. Um, and the clarification came that they were asking about both. So maybe we take the, yeah. what about the challenges for the brands part of the question as well? Yes. I think so. I think for brands, one of the big things that I always say brands kind of need to do is to give creator space 
to take the brief and translate it in a way that works for their audience, right? So Mm -hmm. as marketers, we have our KPIs, we want these key selling points, but it's going to seem inauthentic if you don't give the creator space to translate it in a way that's going to feel authentic and real to their audience. So I think one of the challenges with the creator economy is how do we get people that are, um, you know, able to talk about the brands in a way that is going to feel relatable to the audience. Yeah, makes perfect sense. All right, so our next audience question. Um, you mentioned using multiple platforms to get your content out there. Do you foresee a convergence in the future or will there always be multiple platforms in your opinion? I think there will always be multiple platforms. And I think mm-hmm. we're moving away from a place where I think creators are platform agnostic now, right? You kind of want to get your message out on multiple like platforms because that's more of an opportunity to cultivate community. Now, I am probably biased because I work at Meta, but I do think Meta is the best place to kind of build your home as a creator because it's that 360 approach. If I am, let's say I decide, okay, I want to make some beautiful soaps from from Turkey and sell them directly to my audience, I can use checkout right on Instagram to sell that product. Um, I think that there is something about whether it's the Facebook groups product or our video platforms where you're able to have a really holistic presence on Meta that you can't necessarily get from another platform. That being said, I think the reality of it is creators are always going to work across platforms, especially really seasoned video creators. They're probably also going to be on TikTok and YouTube. And that's okay. You know, we we can't expect creators to be totally loyal to one platform. But I do think it is um I do think it is going to be interesting to see which platforms creators prioritize. And selfishly I hope that it is meta platforms that they prioritize. <laughs> All right. So that leads me to um, the topic that seems to be top of mind on any dis- discussion. Of course, it has relevance for creators as well, which is Web3, Metaverse, as we think about the platforms, where everything is going. How do you think Metaverse will impact creators, the creator economy, and everything that is around it? Yeah, so I think the metaverse is super exciting. And as we think about like Web3 creators and NFT creators, we just launched on Instagram our collectibles product where you can actually sell NFTs directly on Instagram, which I think is really exciting. (coughs) Excuse my cough, I have allergies. Um, Web3 creators are kind of like this totally different class of creators. If you think about things like avatars, I think we're going to see creators that are interested and invested in how do we create makeup looks for avatars who's designing clothes that these avatars will wear is it nike and gucci or do we have this new class of creators that are just designing clothes for avatars to wear in the metaverse i think that's really exciting as we've been talking about i have a podcast so i've been thinking about in the metaverse will i have uh, opportunities to do like round tables or fireside chats in the metaverse where people can all come together in the metaverse and hear a conversation about um, podcasting. So I think there's a ton of opportunity. I think we're still early days in the metaverse, but what excites me about it is it's kind of unlocking this new level of creativity and it's allowing for a different type of creator to come to the forefront. Yeah. Um, how does one even in your opinion, like start thinking about it, um, about metaverse and what their creator journey might be in the future. Yeah. So I think, you know, it's very helpful to think of the metaverse as it's, it's a, it's like a series of spaces, right. That you can Mm -hmm. interact with people, um, in a way that you can't do in a two-dimensional space. Um, And I think that we're very far from like the future vision of the metaverse where you have like entire worlds built. That being said, I think for creators specifically, if you're already building your community on social, I think it's important to now start thinking about how does that community evolve with the metaverse? And how do you think about if I have like a room in the metaverse, let's say for Naked Beauty, my podcast, I have like some sort of lounge in the metaverse. Like what are the brand colors? Like what's the music that's playing in the lounge? What, what do I want um, for the experience to be? It kind of allows people to think about their content and their community from a more experiential lens. Yeah. 
Thank you. Um, there is another question. Uh, it's on the Turkish channel, so I will do my best to interpret what I think it is asking. Um, I think the question is about um, as a creator, whether or how to share um, your personal background, um, health um, situation, or like anything that might be positive or negative about you, how much to share that with your audience? Yes, this is a great question. I think a lot of creators struggle with this, right? Like how personal is too personal? What do you yeah. keep to yourself uh, versus what do you you share? I've learned from, you know, my husband, you know, in Turkish culture, you have evil eye. That's like a thing as yeah. well. Like you don't want to share, share too much. So, you know, some of it is is cultural as well. I think it's really about finding what feels comfortable to you. So some people say, um, I don't want to share my children. Now, I do think if there's something that you're excited about in your personal life and you want to share it, then go ahead and share it. I kind of share everything. I also think to the to the point about bad things that are happening, I think people really appreciate that. So often social media can feel like this highlight reel and it can feel like everyone is happy and everything is going great for everyone. But I think if you take the time to talk about when things aren't going great, um, when you're having challenges and maybe how you've overcome those challenges or how you're trying to figure them out, that makes you so much more relatable and authentic to your audience. So if you are going through something difficult, I think there's power in sharing that to a broad audience. Yeah. Well, thank you. And that is also um, very refreshing to hear, right? Yes. Uh, from <laughs> from the creators or people who are in this community. Um, so in the um, Silicon Valley Network, we talk a lot about investments, startups, et cetera, as well. Um, how do you think about creator economy as an opportunity from an investment perspective and the various startups that might be coming up that we know there's a ton and more are coming up yes. um, to help grow and enable this ecosystem. Yes, I, I love this question because I think that one of the things that we're going to see increase over time is that I think creators actually need a lot of help with financial services and financial planning, right? So um, as you get brand deals, you need to have things like W-2s and W-9s and you have to read through contracts and you have to figure out kind of a lot of stuff. And you know, if your passion is, you know, nail art and doing manicures, and now you're also asked to be like a business manager to negotiate all of these deals, it can be really difficult. So I do think that there's going to be a new sector that's going to emerge more and more that kind of like holds creators hands and helps them through contract negotiation, figuring out payment terms, also helping creators negotiate these contracts with um, brands and thinking about scalable solutions. So creators can do things like track their payment, making sure they're getting mm -hmm. paid on time. I think that's a space that's really going to grow. I also think anything around video editing is a really interesting space right now. We know that um, across all platforms, video is going to become increasingly increasingly important. And I think that we have a great, we do a great job on Meta of providing a lot of video editing tools. But I think that anything around uh, video editing, uh, like video content creation is also going to grow over time as video becomes more front and center. So I would say video and financial mm -hmm. services and kind of business planning. Great tips. Uh, okay, we have another audience question. Uh, do you think everyone will need to become a creator at some point for their personal brand? If so, how do you find the balance between creating versus doing your work? This is a great question. I think that it depends what industry you're in. <coughs> and excuse me, I'm sorry about my, my cough. It depends what industry you're in. I think that if you, um, you know, work in tech or social media, it is very helpful to have a presence on social. Now, do you have to be creating a reel every single day? I don't think so. But I think you want to start thinking about what is my personal brand and what do I want to communicate to people about what I care about? I don't think it's a, a need, but I think it's a nice to have. Um, I think small business owners, for example, they kind of have to become content creators now as well, right? To talk about their product and their business. So even if you're in a very corporate profession, or even if you are someone that is not a content creator full-time, 
I do think that there is a benefit to honing your personal brand and having a presence on social that you can maintain. So maybe you say, I can only update once a week, but I'm going to try to keep up the once a week. And what's the thing that I want to communicate with my page? How are you intentional about what do I want to communicate with my presence on this platform? Yeah. Um, okay, so another question. Um, as a marketer, we can sometimes find ourselves stuck with no growth, especially working for a company where there are only one to two people in marketing. Um, how do we overcome that sense of stagnation? How do content creators and marketers keep growing? Yes, yeah, so I love this question. I, I think that like sense of stagnation or feeling like you're not growing it's really helpful to think about how can I expand my skill set to learn new things? So maybe it's about going to your boss or the head of a company to say, Web3 and NFTs are a really exciting space. And I don't know if we as a company have figured it out quite yet. I want to attend, you know, this webinar and it only costs this, you know, small, small amount of money to attend, or I found a free webinar. Can I attend and then come back to the company and present, you know, some findings or takeaways that we should be integrating into our strategy? So I think mm -hmm. looking for opportunities to educate yourself on new um, mediums and future opportunities is a great way to feel like you are growing. I think um, the second part of the question was how do content creators keep growing? I think it's about, you know, how can asking yourself always, how can I push myself to do things that I haven't done yet? How can I push myself to do things that I haven't seen other people um, do to make my content that much more interesting? So right now, one of the things that I'm thinking through is I talk about skincare and beauty and that's great, but how can I use my platform to give other people a voice to do that? So how do I sort of like hand over the keys to my platform and have different people do stories takeovers and have different people give their voice on my Naked Beauty Planet account? So thinking through what can I do to get to that next evolution or next phase of, of my content? Yeah, um, that actually prompted something for me. Um, we mentioned that it does take time, right, for some of this to work. And let's say you're a marketer and you are starting to explore um, creator marketing as a brand owner, for example. Um, how do you sell it or pitch it to others in the company, for example, who might not be as familiar with um, how long it might take for something to actually work? Yes, I'm a really big fan of doing a test. So when I worked at Ralph Lauren, influencer marketing was relatively new and there was a lot of, um, <coughs> sorry, excuse me. There was a lot of hesitation around doing it. So I yeah. said, okay, give me a very, very small budget and let me just do a test. This is a creator. She has a really big audience. Let's just test this one time small thing with her and see how it goes. And it did incredibly well. After it did really well, we were able to scale it. So I think for companies that are really hesitant, it's really uh, easy to just say, let's just do a small test. Even if you don't have budget, let's just send this product to these small micro influencers and see how they interact with it. Let's see the content we get out of it and then scale from there. Yeah, that's a great tip. Okay, so we're gonna start wrapping up. <laughs> um, and I am seeing more questions. And this is something that I also wanted to ask you about too. Um, you know, what do you think about Turkish influencers? What are some of the trends that you're seeing on Turkish um, accounts on Instagram? Because Turkey happens to be one of the most active countries on Very the platform. Very active, yes. Yeah, so would love to hear some insights from you. Yes, and I, again, I'm so sorry about my allergies. It's like really bad, <laughs> um, but I think, what has been so fascinating for me to see, even back to like when IG, IGTV first launched, so many Turkish creators have embraced video, specifically food, specifically chefs. Now, I don't know, I would, I would, I would love to hear everyone's thoughts, maybe on chat or Peck, you can share your thoughts. I don't know if this is because of Nusret and like the popularity of Salt Bay, <laughs> where other people were like, oh, he was really successful doing this. So maybe I should you know, start making videos as well. But I've been amazed at how chefs of really large restaurants in Turkey and like really small, just kind of like kebab stands have used video 
really amazing video to communicate their brand and to build an audience. And I think that a lot of uh, the tourism that we see around Turkey is like a direct benefit uh, sorry, directly benefits from this incredible content creation that people are making in the country about just how beautiful Turkey is, how amazing the food is. And food specifically, I think, is this area that's just like, I always see so many like Turkish, like cooks and chefs doing videos. Do you think that's because of Nusret and his popularity? Um, I think it might have some influence, but I do think, you know, food is so huge in our culture. I mean, as you know, like you visit Turkey <laughs> every summer. Um, it, it is such a huge culture. I also do think people do get inspired from one another. Um, and um, although it's something that you might have prepared multiple times, it's always like, there's always this interest about like, maybe I can learn this like additional tip, et cetera. Um, but, you know, probably Nusrat had um, his influence on the whole space. Yes. And not just within Turkey, beyond Turkey as well. Right? Oh my gosh. Yes. Very. I mean, two streets down from us, he just opened um, one of his restaurants and I, I saw him there in, in the window serving meats to people. So, I mean, he's a very powerful story of how you can just take a platform, a, a very specific brand, and then blow that up to like a real global business. So um, I, I love what he's done with video to, to grow his business. All right. Um, thank you so much. Um, we're going to wrap up and we're also going to make sure that you're good with the <laughs> allergies as well. Okay. Really, really appreciate your time, all the amazing insights that you shared with us and um, really uh, enjoyed having you on our platform today. So thank you so much for being oh here. Oh my gosh. Of course. Of course. And if, and if people have questions, please feel free to DM me. I'm at Brooke DeVard on um, Instagram. If you have any questions or if there's anything that I can help to answer more, I am here to, to uh, help. So I hope this was helpful. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody. We look forward to seeing you at a future to see at Silicon Valley Network event. Have a lovely day. Thank you day. for having me. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.